Good morning. We're glad you're here. We're going to sing a song this morning to begin. It's 459 and Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Let's stand as we sing, please. <clears throat> what a fellowship. Sing together with me. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure, all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And the last stanza. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Good. Go ahead and have a seat. And let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you today that your word tells us and declares that underneath are the everlasting arms. We're not just kind of floating out here. These things are not just random. You have put us in this place even today, and I thank you for our brother and our sister who have come to serve and to minister this morning and tonight and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. We pray for your blessing upon them in so many ways, certainly their health and strength, and they're just kind of fitting in and connecting with our folks here. Thank you for all the years of their ministry. And Lord, we want to ask you today that you would uh, use their ministry, singing all the, the puppets and the chalk talk, the preaching, the word of the Lord, uh, to make a difference in each of our lives. I pray as we ask for your blessing that we could be a very significant part of that blessing, both with our attendance, uh, our attention, our inviting of others, um, the offering, of course, and uh, so we ask for your blessing in all these areas, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so you know the webs, I think. Uh, we've got Cheryl on the piano. She's going to play the piano all week except for the invitation, and uh, she's going to be conducting Children's Church for uh, all the children starting in the, sun, in, in the morning service and uh, right through Wednesday, so that'll be back in the Children's Church room. Uh, and they'll be dismissed, I think, just for the sermon. Yes. Right? Yep, that's what we'll do. So, um, and that is grade, I forget what it was. Was it age 10? Grade? Age 10 and down. Age 10 and down? Okay, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever you want. But, um, yeah, you'll figure it out, and, uh, you know, and they'll be there. Uh, and then uh, they also have the music. So you heard the one horn playing today. I'm not sure which one he was playing before the Sunday school hour. And I said to Josiah, how do you like that horn? I said, maybe someday you could play something like that. And he said, I want to play an electric guitar. <laughs> okay, well, whatever. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, invite folks to come. And uh, the Chalk Talks, that starts tomorrow night. That'll be tomorrow night and Tuesday night. I think tonight. tonight, tonight and Tuesday night, and then the puppets start t tomorrow night, Monday and Wednesday, but there's a little sneak preview this morning with the puppets. I'm going to give the rest of the time to our brother, and uh, please take a look at their display back there, and uh, at a certain point this morning, there will be a dismissal of the children. All right, good, great.
Well, it's nice to see each one of you here this morning. We're glad that you're here, and we trust that the meeting will be a blessing to your heart this morning as we start out in our Sunday school hour. I hope you realize by the time we finish our service this evening, we'll already be halfway through our special meetings this week. Seems uh, like that's uh, too fast, but uh, it is too fast, but it's, that's the way it goes when you have Sunday through Wednesday, uh, three services on Sunday, that's half the amount of services of the week, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, that's the other half. So let me encourage you to be here for all of those services. If you say, well, I normally do my laundry at the laundromat on Monday or Tuesday, or I do my grocery shopping, save that for Thursday or Friday this week. And uh, make, make the, the Lord's house the first place you want to be throughout the week this week. First, put him first. Uh, in just a moment, we are going to go over to the Puppet Castle and see if anybody's awake and at home there uh, to be able to share a story with us before our Sunday School message time as well. But first, we want to start with a about horn and piano duet uh, between Cheryl and myself. Uh, the horn that I want to play this morning is called a, a euphonium, although boys and girls, it's my phonium when I play it, so you can't play it. But anyway, uh, that's the largest horn that I play, uh, and then we have other horns that we play too. You'll be hearing this week when uh, we'll be playing the flugabone from the offertory in the morning service this morning as well. That's a trombone with a slide taken off and valves put on instead. I guess that way it keeps you from hitting the fellow in the row in front of you in the band in the back of his head when you're doing a formation on the ball field. But in any case, I bought it to take overseas on the foreign trips that we make as we just came back a week ago from Australia down under. So uh, we're uh, still getting over jet lag and those kind of things there, but we're glad to be able to be with you. And I don't have to worry about jet lag when I'm the one doing the preaching. So uh, you, I hope that jet lag doesn't get on you while I'm preaching because that makes you want get, to get sleepy uh, during that time period. You know, uh, it's a wonderful joy to be able to know Christ as personal Savior, to travel outside of the U.S. like we just have as well and have done before. We can go all over, play, all over the world and other places and find folks of like precious faith who also belong to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's that same joy and that same gladness in being a child of God when we know that we're saved. It's like heaven came down and glory filled my soul. people and looking forward to that time for today. Right now we are going to go over to the puppet castle and uh, if we come in and folks come in, I hear folks that have not been in a ministry before and they say, oh puppets, the children will really like this. 
And then I hear more laughter out of the adults than I do out of the kids, which is fine. You'll find they're just not, not for the kids. They're for everybody to be able to enjoy. And uh, though they may be entertaining, there's always an important Bible message that they have to share with us as well. So without any further ado, we'll see if we can find Mrs. Webb uh, to find somebody in the castle that has a story for us today. Okay, let me just give a knock on the wall, see if we can wake somebody up in here this morning. Now, sometimes it's early Sunday morning and they're still sleeping in bed. Wake up. Ah, here comes someone. Who is that? <laughs> oh. Well, 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 well. If it is Mrs. Webfoot. How you doing, Mrs. Webfoot? My name is not Webfoot. Yeah, uh, sure it is. You have, uh, you're married to a web, aren't you? Yes. Your last name's Webb, isn't it? Yes. Then you have web feet. <laughs> I better explain who this is. Yes, why don't you do that? Some of these people here have not had the privilege of meeting me yet. Oh, they've been lucky enough not to have met that's you yet. That's just your opinion, Mrs. Webfoot. Anyway, this is Mr. Evil. That's right, that's right, that's right. Mr. Evil is one of Satan's helpers. That's right, too. And this is Mrs. Webfoot. She's one of the goody two-shirts here for whatever it is you're here for this week. What are you doing here this morning? What am I doing here? What are all these people doing here this morning, huh? We're here for Sunday school. No, no, don't you know this is Sunday morning? You're supposed to stay home at Betty by Baptist with Pastor Sheets. <laughs> He's a good pastor. He's got you covered. <laughs> so why don't you make like a tree and leaf, huh? Or put an egg in your shoe and beat it, will you? Oh, or make like a good fundamental Bible preaching church and split, man. <laughs> You're terrible. Thank you, I do try. We need to get rid of him this morning. No, 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 you can't get rid of me. I'm busy trying to get rid of you. So why don't you go play on the freeway? You don't have far to go to find one. All right, listen, there's one thing that Mr. Evil is afraid of. I'm not afraid of anything, Mrs. Webfoot, particularly not you. Well, you are afraid of the Bible. Yuck, I hate the Bible. I don't mind when it lays around and eats a bunch of magazines and newspapers and gathers dust, but I hate when people read it and memorize it and quote it and really bugs them when people get saved because of it. Well, we're going to see a Bible verse together this morning and scare you off. Ha, ha, ha. Do you think these people are going to help you? Yes. <laughs> Even if you do need lots of help? Upstairs? <laughs> All right. I think everyone here knows John 3.16. No, no. Nobody here knows John 3.16. And if you used to know it, you have amnesia and you forgot it. No, they know it. Let's say this really loud together and we'll no, get rid no, of him. No, no, no. Let's not say anything. Let's just sit here and stare at Mrs. Webfoot and make her feel really self-conscious, okay? Okay. Are you ready? Yep. Oh, we're ready to stare. Here All we right. go. Here we go. We're going to stare. John 3.16. Hey, no, no. You're not to speak. To For stare. God no, so stop that. No. Close mouth. Open eyes. No, no, no. Don't do that. Son. Don't quote the that Bible of all things. The master has to leave when you do that. I have to leave when you do that. But I'll get you people for this. Ooh, I'll get you all later no. for that. You just wait. You just think so, Mr. Evil. I don't think so, Mrs. Webfoot. I know so. You think so. I know so. You think so. I know so. You think so. I know so. Well, I'm glad he's gone anyway. That's what you think. <sighs> all right, let me try again. Oh, it's a dragon. Well, of course it's a dragon. What I look like to you, Snow White? No, you look like a dragon. That's because I am a dragon, Mrs. Webb. Oh, uh, you must be Durwood the dragon. Yes, ma'am, Durwood dragon at your service. Oh, glad to see you out here so bright and early oh, this morning. Oh, it's very, very nice to be able to be here in Sunday school. It's my favorite service of all the meetings of the week. Your favorite service? Yes, ma'am. It's the one opportunity I really have to, to be with some of my own kind. To be with some of your own Yes, ma'am, after some people being up late last evening and then getting up early to come to Sunday school, well, everybody's dragon. All right. So I thought I'd come maybe with some of the other dragons, you know what I mean? That's real nice, Druid. Sure. Uh, uh, maybe between, between now and the morning service, we'll have some more folks dragon, too. <laughs> maybe so. Maybe um, so. But we do want to have a story for everyone this morning. Oh, well, don't look at me, Mr. Webb. I don't tell very good Bible stories. By the time I get through with them, they get a little monotonous. Monotonous? Yes, ma'am. You do talk a little bit funny. Oh, no, I don't talk funny. I talk normal. Everybody else talks funny. Where are you from, anyway? Oh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Oh, that explains Actually, it. I was born in North Jersey, but I moved to Brooklyn at a very early age. Uh, is that right? Yes, ma'am. The, the sewer I grew up in was lovely. Oh. <laughs> no, listen. Le, 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 it was beautiful till later they renovated it and turned it into a subway. <laughs> uh. 
Now I don't know which side of the tracks I live on. All uh, right. So if you're not telling the story, maybe we'll see you later on, okay? Oh, I don't know about that, Mr. Webb, because the other type is that they're going to be in the evenings, yes? Yes. I, I make it a point not to come out of the castle in the evenings. I'll be here, but I will be uh, on standby. You don't come out. Why not? Because in the, even, uh, the night, uh, in the evening, it is nighttime, yes? Yes. You know what nights do to dragons. Oh, that's right. That would really slay me, you know what I mean? Right. So maybe right. I'll see you some other time. All but right. uh, I hope you'll all have a very good day. Uh, and, and, and the Lord bless. Okay? Thank Goodbye, you. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. See ya. Well, I'm glad he stopped by to say hello. I'll just try again, though. Skibidi bap bap, sidi skarata. Skip, skip, dee, 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 oh, hey, how you doing, Mr. Webb? Good, how are you? I'm doing okay. Nice to see everybody else made it out for the Sunny School Sunday puppet lesson. Yes, we're glad to see everybody here this morning. Yeah, well, I'm sorry I'm late getting out here for the story. I was brushing my teeth. You know, that takes us alligators a little longer than the average person. All uh, right. Yes. We have more teeth. Right. <laughs> and shorter arms. <laughs> oh, this is Big Al the Alligator. Right, right? Big Al the Alligator, the coolest alligator in the north, south, east, and west, man. Wait a minute. <laughs> and and as of a few days ago, I was the coolest alligator in the down under, too. Wait a minute. What do you mean, coolest alligator? Well, because green is cool, man, and, and I'm green, so that means I'm cool, man. Green is cool? That's right. Anybody wearing green today is cool, man. Oh, we have a couple of cool Even people. Even if you're not wearing green today, you can still be cool. How's that? Stand in front of an air conditioner, man. You'll be real oh. cool. <laughs> so are you here to tell the story this morning? Am I here to tell the story this morning? I, I'm going to be helping with the story this morning, yes. Oh, is somebody else coming? Hopefully, if I'm helping, there should be somebody who's telling. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Going up, step through the car, please. A top floor, please. Oh, somebody's coming up in the elevator. Top floor. Thanks, bud. Whoop. Okay, who left a, wi a wire running across the floor back here? Oh, oh, hello there. Can I play Mary in the Christmas play this year? <laughs> get off of me, you silly curtain. What's the matter? You stop that. Get away from me. Mrs. Webb, I can't get... Oh, there you are. How are, How are you, you this doing morning? this morning, Mr. Webb? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing okay. Boy, I'll tell you what. It's been raiding cats and dogs in some place over the it weekend. It has been. That's true. Yeah, yeah. You know how I know? How do you know? I stepped in a poodle this morning. Uh, yeah, okay, well, look, uh, Homer, I'm glad you made it out here for today. Uh, we were hoping somebody would have a story. Oh, I have the story for this morning. Oh, really? Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Homer. You mean to tell us you're prepared? No, I'm Homer. Did you forget my name that fast? <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, you're ready for a story this morning. Oh, yes. I'm all set for a story. Okay, well, good. What's the story going to be about? Well, today we're going to tell the story of zucchini and the beanstalk. What? Uh, I said we're going to tell a story about zucchini and the beanstalk. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, Homer. I thought I heard all the Bible stories, and I don't remember any stories about zucchinis or beanstalks. No. You never heard the story about the little short guy whose name was Zucchini who wanted to see Jesus so badly. So he ran in at Jesus and he climbed up in a beanstalk. And when Jesus came along, he looked up in the beanstalk and he said, Zucchini, you come down for I'm going to your house today. Oh, Homer, that is not Zucchini. What? No, it's Zacchaeus. Who? Zacchaeus. 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 Okay, I got his name already. And in stereo even. And it's not a beanstalk he climbed up in either. It's not. No, it was a sycamore tree. A what? A sycamore tree. 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 Look, you guys quit it or I'll be sick or more. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it was Zacchaeus and it was a sycamore tree. I know, I know. I was just joking. I was trying to see how many people were actually awake today. <laughs> Well, uh, I think most of them are awake. But anyway, uh, uh, so you, today you're going to tell the story about uh, uh, z z zucchini. I mean, Zacchaeus? Yeah, I know lots and lots about Zacchaeus. You do? Yes, because Zacchaeus and I both have the same hobby. The same what? hobby? I didn't know the Bible even said Zacchaeus had a hobby. Oh, sure. Zacchaeus collected tax, and so do I. Homer, you collect tax? Yes. You collect tax? Yes. I collect upholstery tax, carpet tax, thumb tax. And those pretty cool pushpin things. I like those. No, 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 Homer, wait a minute. You collect tax. Right. But Zacchaeus collected tax. That's what I said. No, no, no. Zacchaeus collected income tax. Mrs. Webb, I don't care whether they're coming in or they're going out. What difference does it make which way they're facing? I have left-handed tax and right-handed tax, too. No, no, Homer, and listen. ambidextrous Homer, tax. Homer, Homer, Homer. Zacchaeus is a publican. A what? A, a publican. publican. 
Now, what difference does it make how he votes in the elections? I don't care whether it's a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. No, 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 no. Now, you're thinking of a Republican. That's the person who's been public twice. Homer. Listen, no, no. Zacchaeus what? collected money. What? He collected money. Say, now you're talking. That's a whole lot more fun than collecting pointy little push pins. Right, and that wasn't his hobby or uh, hobby either. It wasn't his hobby? No, that was his job. Wait a minute. Zacchaeus got paid for collecting money? That's right. What a cushy job that was. Well, actually, you see, he worked for the Roman government. Oh, you mean like the Infernal Revenue Service? That's internal. Depends on who you're talking to. Yeah, anyway, yeah, you see, the Romans had conquered the Jews, and they had hired some of the Jewish people to collect taxes for the Roman government. Oh, taxes. Yes. That's different than my kind of tax. Yes, huh? yes. Yeah, but you see, people hated tax collectors back then. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but I don't think a whole lot of them today either. <laughs> Homer. I, I know that, Homer, but you see, back then, tax collectors were thieves and robbers and crooks. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but Homer. today, oh, <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble with the IRS, the CIA, and the whole other three-letter bunch. No, Homer, look, anyway, uh, Zacchaeus uh, was working for the government, like I said, and if the government required him to collect 20 or $40 in taxes, yes, he would collect 60 80 or even more. <gasps> but that's being a thief. Right. That's stealing. That's right. That's dishonest. That's right. Where are your morals, Big Al? That's not right. That's wrong. No, no, I mean, you're correct, you're correct. He, he, what a rotten thing to do, be stealing money from people all the time. Yeah, 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 but uh, he did it for the same reason everybody does sinful things. Why? Because everybody's born a sinner. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Oh, that's true. And everybody proves it from the sinful things they do from the time they're born, disobeying their parents, telling lies, stealing things, doing other stuff like that, just like Zacchaeus was doing. Right, because everybody's born a sinner, and they sin, choose, they choose to sin against God. Yeah, well, okay, but? But, but Zacchaeus heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that's a very good thing, and he wanted to get a chance to see who Jesus was. That's a good thing, too. And finally, he had his chance, because Jesus came to the city of Jericho, where Zacchaeus was living. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, Zacchaeus gets a chance to see Jesus. Actually, he had a problem. What, he couldn't get off of work that day? No. no. Uh, uh, what was the problem? The problem was that wherever the Lord Jesus Christ went, there were great crowds of people around him. So, so Zacchaeus uh, uh, was short. Wait a minute, what? I said Zacchaeus was short. Well, uh, how, how could he ever be short if he's collecting money all the time? <laughs> no, not short of money. Oh, not short of money? No, I mean short of stature. Of course it's me. What you say a statue? I didn't say a statue. No, look, what I mean is he was a shrimp. You mean he laid around on the bottom of the ocean all day long? Not that oh, kind no. of shrimp. I mean, he was sawed off. Oh, did he help an amateur magician one day and get cut in half? <laughs> did he run to the telephone booth, dial the operator and say, Operator, I've been cut off. <laughs> oh, no, no, listen, he wasn't very tall. What? He wasn't very tall. Oh, in today's publicly correct society, you would have to say that Zacchaeus was vertically challenged. Yes, well, anyway, because of that, he couldn't see over the crowd to even see who Jesus was, never mind get a chance to talk to Jesus. So I guess he had to give up and go home that day. No, that's not what he did. He found out the direction Jesus was headed, ran ahead down the road, and found a sycamore tree with its branches hanging out over the road. What's he looking for a tree for? Is he going to try to catch a squirrel? Try to catch a squirrel. Catch a squirrel. Yeah, you climb up in a tree and act like a nut. <laughs> Works every time. No, 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 no. He, he climbed up in the tree so he could get a bird's eye view of Jesus. Why didn't you just pay some bird to do it for him? Homer, he wanted to see Jesus himself. Yes. Oh, oh, so? So he climbed up in the tree and went out into the branches. Hey, he's one of the first people in recorded history to ever go out on a limb. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, when Jesus came by that way, Zacchaeus got an even closer look at the Lord than he thought he was going to. Why is that? Because Jesus stopped right underneath the tree where Zacchaeus was, looked straight up at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down because today I must abide at your house. Uh-oh, I'll bet you Zacchaeus got in really big trouble with Mrs. Zacchaeus. Why do you say that? He did not tell her he was bringing company home for dinner. Yeah, well, anyway, when Zacchaeus went to Jesus, uh, Z, or excuse me, Z, Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house, Zacchaeus, uh, d d d something wonderful happened. D they had a delicious meal. 
Yes, they did have a delicious meal, but that's not the great thing that happened. What's that? Zacchaeus was saved. He was? Yes. Now, we know that because, first of all, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, this day is salvation. Come to your house. Boy, you can't beat the word of the Lord for knowing your same time. That's true. That's right. But also we know because Zacchaeus made a change. Uh, he made a change? Yeah. He changed a $5 bill for a couple of ones. Not that kind of change. Remember, he had been a thief, a robber, and a crook. Yes. In fact, he was the chief thief. Yes, he was. He was head of all the other tax collectors. Yeah. So, so when he had received the Lord Jesus Christ, he told him that if he had stolen anything from anybody or taken anything unjustly from someone, he would give it back with interest. Boy, they must have thought he belonged in a restitution. A what? You mean an institution? I thought a restitution was an institution where you're arrested. Oh, Never mind. Anyway, yeah, I'm sure lots of people notice the difference in the life of Zacchaeus. And just think how many other people he could tell what the difference was for. Because it was Jesus. And what Jesus did for him, they could do for them too. Right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I, I hope that there's anybody here today, uh, first of all, who is like Zacchaeus. What do you mean? I mean that they, they, they're sinners who need the Lord. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. And the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. That separates from God forever in hell. But God is not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, but that all should come to repentance. Right, so John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's exactly right. So I hope that there's anybody here today who's never turned from their sin and trusted what Jesus did on the cross for them and taken his gift of eternal life for the asking. I hope that they will do that today. Very good. I hope they will too. But, uh, you know, I hope that everybody would also remember what the Bible said about Zacchaeus. What was that? About the change that, made, that was different in him when he had received Jesus. Oh, yeah. Because there are a lot of people that run around the world today and they say they're saved, but when you look at their lives, there is no proof. That's right. And the Bible says if a person is truly saved, there'll be a change in their life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Right, That's right. So I hope if there's anybody here today who's a Christian, but their life hasn't changed much, I hope that they will ask God to do a renovation work in their heart. You know all what right. renovation is? Yes. <laughs> Good, because I don't. Yeah, I mean, he means a change. Oh, yeah, that's what we were talking about, a change in people's lives. That's exactly right. So I hope if there's anybody here who needs a change, that today they will ask the Lord to make that in their lives so that people will not only hear the gospel from their lips, but will get the gospel from their lives too. All right, that's good. Okay, well, it's been really good to see everybody here. Maybe we'll see you again later this week. Till then, bye-bye, everybody. Bye. bop bop CDT. Skadata. Skip, skibbidi-bidi-bidi-bop. All right, Homer, thanks for helping. We'll see you later, okay? Oh, okay. All right, goodbye. Yeah. Uh, All right. Mythoid. Now it is time for a Sunday school message, and so right now, oh yeah, it'll be nice to see some of the other kids throughout the week this week, right? Like Josiah and and uh, Emmanuel, and let's see uh, some of the young ladies that are here yes, too. Yes, it will be nice, or okay, yes. but goodbye, goodbye, home. Oh, yeah. All right, goodbye. All right, now it is time for a Sunday school message. Um, Homer. Yes, ma'am. When you say goodbye, you're supposed to leave. Oh. Well, why didn't you? <laughs> Not me, Homer. Oh, I'm supposed to leave. Yes. How silly of me. Okay, right. goodbye, Mr. Goodbye, Webb. Homer. Goodbye, everybody. All right, goodbye. Okay, good. Now, it is time for a Sunday school message. <sighs> Homer, is there a problem? Yes, ma'am. This curtain thing is back in my way again here. Homer, you just back up to the just window. Back the up same to the no, 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 I saw that. You tried to give me a dog aside. You want me to go splat down there? No, Homer, just back up. Is there up. a boot hill outside of town? They're going to bury me in. Homer, Homer, just back up. What? Back up? Back up, yes. Like this? Yes, a little further. Like this? A little further. Yeah, wait, I got to get my, my, my beeper. Beep, beep, <laughs> beep, 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 beep. What? <laughs> oh. oh, that set of steps gets me every time. Homer, are you all right? Uh, let's see. Head bone connected to the neck bone, neck bone connected to the shoulder bone, shoulder bone. Yeah, I think so, Mr. Webb. Well, no right. broken bones. All right. Oh, right. bones! That reminds me, I did not have any breakfast yet. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that story this morning. It is time now for Sunday school. So the children who are primary age and younger can be dismissed right now to their Sunday school classes. And if you are older than primary age, you're remaining in here in the auditorium, let me invite you to take your Bible and turn with, if you would please, to the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4.
Let me encourage you to be faithful to be with us each one of the services this week. Again, as we mentioned, after tonight's service, we'll already be halfway through. Uh, we'll be having two chalk drawings this week, one on tonight's service and tonight's service, one on Tuesday night. So as you're inviting folks to come, let them know the nights that we're doing the chalk drawings. You may want to take a, a photograph of uh, one of the uh, drawings that we do. or uh, You can take a, draw, you know, a, a photograph of the one in the back of the auditorium that's hanging on the wall there, too, that we did in the past. Uh, but you can uh, put, post that on your, your social uh, w uh, website. Uh, your, uh, let people know what's going on this week. Invite them to come and be with you. Uh, take a photograph of it. Take it to work with you tomorrow. Show it around. And tell people, hey, the evangelist draws these things in 15 minutes' time, and there's music and story in the background, and colored light and black light effects on the drawing, too. And that's all true. And uh, we want to encourage you to be inviting and asking folks to come on those nights. But uh, the nights that we're not doing the chalk art drawings, we're doing the puppets. Uh, so we, we always do that so the adults don't get uh, upset at us. Uh, we have to have the puppets every other night from the chalk drawing. So they'll be here with us, and uh, we hope that you'll make your plans to be with us every night. There'll be special music as well as the preaching of the Word of God. The beginning of the week of meetings, we're preaching more toward believers for the last couple of nights of the services, particularly Tuesday night and Wednesday night. Lord willing, we'll be preaching very clear evangelistic messages. Now, don't stay home if you're a Christian on those nights because you need to get here so you can jot down all the scriptures we're going to give you to help you to be more effective in answering people's questions about salvation. Don't forget the Bible says for those of us who are believers that we need to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us of the reason of the hope that is within us with meekness and fear. And I hope that you can do that. If you can't, we'll help you with that this week. But we really want to encourage you to line up a friend, a business associate, a co-worker, uh, a na next door neighbor, a ball team mate, somebody else from your karate dojo your kids go to or something else that way to come and join you for the special meetings that we'll be having throughout the week this week. So let me encourage you to keep those things in mind. Uh, Pastor mentioned already the table that's in the back. We'll talk about that just a little bit more in the morning service. But let me encourage you now to uh, take your Bible. And if you would, if you're able, I don't hear any more pages rustling. Let's stand, if you would, please, with me as I read our scripture text in honor to the word of God as this read. It says in verse one, and he began again to teach by the seaside and there was gathered unto him a great multitude so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea and the whole, whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and it yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he Send unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Let's remain standing for prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together this morning as we begin these uh, few days of special meetings. We pray, Lord, that you would work in a special way in each one of our hearts and our lives. We pray that you would do a work of preparing our hearts to receive the things that you would give to us from your word these days. And we'll thank you for it, for we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. The next verse uh, from where we stopped reading says in verse 10, when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked them the parable. They wanted to know the meaning of the parable he had just given them. And the Bible says in verse 13, and he said unto them, know ye not this parable and how then will ye know all parables? Hey, do you realize what the Lord Jesus Christ said? He said that knowing and understanding and applying the truth of this parable is the key to unlocking the great truth of the rest of the word of God for our hearts to be able to grow with. What is this parable about? What's the point of this great parable? Well, we can get the idea again to us even before we get to the teaching of the parable in two ways. First of all, you can find it in the sayings of the Lord Jesus. What does he say before he begins to teach? It says in verse two, he taught them many things by parables and he sent unto them in his doctrine. Verse three, what's the first word? Hearken, hearken. You know what that hearken means? It's like when you were in college and the professor said, hey, you need to write this thing down I'm about to tell you. You're going to have to have it on the exam. You need to know it for the exam. It's a vital thing that you need to get a hold of and not miss out on. So the Lord Jesus, even before he starts his teaching, says, hearken, listen, turn on your radar. I'm about to give you something vital you need for life. And then he go, if you skip to the end of the parable, verse 9, he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him what? 
hear. So he not only tells us we need to listen, pay attention, but he also comes to the end of the parable and says, if you got ears, make sure you take heed to what I just told you and make sure you apply what I've just told you in your heart and your life. That's just in the sayings of what he said in preparation and in the ending of what has been taught as the parable itself. But it's even, God, God wanted us not to miss this so much that he even put it in the setting where the story takes place. The setting. What do you mean by the setting, Brother Webb? Well, the Bible tells you in the first verses uh, where the Lord Jesus Christ was. Where, where was uh, the Lord Jesus when he was preaching and teaching this parable? Notice verse 1. He, again, he began to teach where? By the seaside. Okay? So he's by the seaside. That's the first bit of information that it gives us. But we even get more detail than that in this, this first verse as well. It says, where was the Lord Jesus Christ while he was teaching about the seaside? He was in a ship pushed out from the shore. Next question, where were all the people? Huh? Boys and girls, they were out there floating around in the water, right? They were just hanging on to the sides. Of the, no, that's not where they were. The Bible says they were by the shore on the land, by the sea, on the land. So we have that absolutely specific information that is given to us. Why is that so important that God gave that to us? Well, because uh, those of you who know something about sound and how sound travels will recognize that sound waves travel much farther and much more clearly over water than they do over land. And what the Lord Jesus Christ was literally doing here was taking advantage of a natural amplification system. He could have the crowd of people sitting on the, or standing on the shoreline and he could be sitting in the boat out on the water and he didn't have to raise his voice much at all and everybody could hear. The water carried the sound of his voice so everybody could take, heart, uh, take heed and everybody could hearken to what he was trying to tell them. So even in the setting, not just the sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are finding uh, the, the, the idea of the truth of the parable. So what is this parable literally about? Well, it's often been called the parable of the sower and the seed. But to be honest with you, I believe that would be a misnomer because the emphasis and the focus of this parable is not on the sower, nor is it on the seed that's being sown, but rather the focus is on the type of ground into which the seed is falling. What God's word gives us here is four types of ground uh, that, our, our, that, that, that the seed can fall in. And it's talking, when it's talking about that, our hearts. Our hearts, every one of us, even here right now this morning, our hearts are like one of these four types of ground. Every time you come to church and you sit in the pew, your heart is like one of these four types of ground. Anytime you sit down with your Bible at Bible reading time and read the scripture, your heart is one of these four kinds of ground. What are the four types of ground? On what grounds does the word of God fall? Well, notice, let's look at them and what Jesus said about these four types of ground. First of all, it says in verse 15, uh, it came to pass that uh, uh, um, as he sowed, Excuse me, uh, it came to pass, verse 4, as he sowed, some fell by the way, said, oh, by the way, what is it that's being sown here? Well, the Bible says in Mark 4, verse 14, what? The sower soweth the word. So what's being viewed here as being sown that is so important for us to take heed to is the word of God. It's the word of God, okay? So it came to pass, as he sowed the word of God, some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now, he explains this further on down in verse 15 when he says, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Why, what type of ground could we call this kind of ground? Well, we could call this kind of ground uh, petrified ground, or we could call it fruitless ground because it's so hardened and it has not been prepared at all to receive the seed that's about to be sown on it. Anybody here have a dog that you keep at your house at home? Okay, a few of you do. Maybe you have a run out back that he's chained to or a dog house he's chained to or something like that. Let me ask you, is there any grass growing within the reach of his chain? No, it's all worn off. It is packed down hard. It, you can throw all the grass seed you want to on that piece of ground. It's not going to percolate any seed at all because it's petrified. It's hardened. It's packed down. It's worn off. And the, the birds come and carry the seed away before it ever has a chance to get down through that ground. The problem is there are people like that who come to church. You know, you've heard the saying, the light's on, but nobody's home. 
There are some folks who are like that. Their hearts are hardened to the truth of the word of God. They make no preparation in their heart for coming to the house of God when it's about to be preached or taught to them. They make no preparation in their heart as they sit down and read from their Bible reading schedule because that's what they're supposed to do that day or whatever. They, their heart is petrified ground. It's fruitless ground. You can talk to them about soul winning and separation or, 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 or surrender or, or a service to the Lord or even salvation and it doesn't percolate. It doesn't seem to get down into their hearts because it's petrified or fruitless ground. Don't let that be the type of ground your heart is. But there's a second type of ground the Lord Jesus mentions here then in his parable. It says, uh, in, in, uh, uh, back, back up on verse five, some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth and immediately sprang up because it had no depth of earth, but when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. What type of ground is this? Well, notice verse 16, he explains this when he says, these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure, but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. What kind of ground is this? We talked about petrified ground. This kind of ground we could call persecuted ground. Or we could call it fearful ground. Because it says here's a person who receives and accepts the word of God and begins to take place in their, take root in their lives. And then it isn't long before the world begins to make fun of them, begins to pick on them, begins to ostracize them. Now look, let's face it. If there's one thing we all like, it's to be liked. We don't like to be hated. We don't like to be separated. We don't like to be ostracized. We don't like to be left out. We don't like to be called named. We don't like to be marginalized. And so we, there are people who want to receive Christ and they begin to allow him to work in their life. But then they find out very quickly that the lost world in which we live isn't keen on people who live for Jesus, are they? I mean, just look at any time there's an election cycle of any kind. Any person running for office who dares to stay public, say publicly they're a born-again Christian who believes the Bible is God's word, who believe that God created the world in, in, in six literal days and that there was a worldwide flood, they're obviously too loony to be in, in government office, right? That's what they want to tell you. They want to marginalize Christians. They've been trying to get rid of the Ten Commandments out of our courtrooms, our classrooms, our civic buildings. Why? If you admit there's an absolute law of right and wrong, then you have to admit there's an absolute authority, God who gave it before man who must all, all, all one day absolutely give an account of himself. And they don't want to think about that kind of thing. So they figure if we can marginalize Christianity, if we can shut down, shut up, whatever terminology you want to use for the Christians and keep their testimony from out of this world, then we can all live in our wickedness and, and it doesn't make any difference. We're not going to have any consequences to that kind of thing. And the problem is that because we love to be loved and we like to be liked, uh, we, we, so many Christians today don't take a stand for the Lord. They put their tail between their legs and they go the opposite direction like a puppy dog in that regard. Oh, you poor thing, the world says. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't blow your brain away with drugs. You can't uh, be unfaithful to your spouse and ruin your family. You can't be, you know, as Christians, we can do all that garbagey stuff. But the fact is we ought to tell them, hey, I don't need it and I don't want it. Why? Because when you're saved and you're surrendering and so on, the Lord, you don't need a thing this whole world's got to, be, to have to be happy. Uh, the, those, the more you have of that wickedness, the greatest killjoy in this world is sin. And so we shouldn't be like uh, 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 trying to bend over backwards to allow the world to love us or to like us. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said. He said, the world hated me before it hated you. Remember that. They hated the Lord Jesus. They crucified him and he hadn't done a thing to anybody. The fact of the matter is there are a lot of people who are having fearful ground or persecuted ground in their hearts and, and, and they receive the word to start with but then the world begins to make fun at their dedication or their, uh, their witness for the Lord or whatever and so they, they turn away. They, they back off of their testimony for Christ and they become uh, fearful ground. There's a third type of ground Jesus mentions in this parable as well. Verse, <clears throat> uh, if you'll drop down a little bit further there in verse 7 it says, And some fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no fruit. And this is explained in verses 18 and 19 where the Lord Jesus said, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. 
fruitful. What kind of ground is this ground? We could call it, if you will, preoccupied ground or if you will, fleshly ground. But it says, here's a person who hears the word and they receive it in their heart. They begin to put it into practice in their life and then it isn't too long before the old world begins to appeal to their lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And hey, if you want to be happy, you have to have this and you got to do that and you have to go here. You know, it's interesting that my wife and I were going up into Canada a few years ago for meetings up into Quebec and we were listening to the Canadian National Public Radio Station was the only thing we could pick up in that particular part of the country. I think that's the only station in the world that's worse than our national public radio station. Uh, in any case, there were two programs that we heard that afternoon. Uh, both, one was a very rich billionaire, the other was a rich authoress. Uh, they were being interviewed by two different people, uh, two different programs, uh, two different interviewers and interviewees. But interesting to me that they were asked, both of them, all the money they had, all the possessions they had, anywhere they could go, are you happy? You know what they both said? Outright, they said, no, no. Now think about this, Christian friend, sir, ma'am, young person here today. Why is it that so many people who are, as Christians today are bending over backward trying to get all the stuff of the world that the world says you have to have to be happy, and yet all the people of this world who already have that stuff that's supposed to make you happy aren't happy? Does that even make sense? No, look, well, don't let your heart be like that. The, the old things of this world will never satisfy your soul. It's like eating cotton candy. You know what they call that in Australia? Fairy floss. Cool name, uh, fairy floss. Yeah, yeah you know what, but, 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 but cotton candy or fairy floss, whatever you want to call it, it's puffy, it's sparkly, it's colorful, it looks tasty. Rip off a big handful of it, stuff it in your face. What happens two seconds later? Where'd that go? So you rip off another handful of it, put that in your face. What happens to that two seconds later? Where'd that go? You can never get full on cotton candy. You can get sick on cotton candy, but you can't get full on cotton candy. That's the way the things of the world are. You can never be satisfied by the things of the world. Oh, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin, Hebrews chapter 11, but the pleasure of sin is but for a season. And then it's gone and it leaves emptiness and bitterness and guilt and remorse in its wake. Don't, don't, don't let yourself be that way. You know, I, my father used to tell a story about two grave diggers that hung around the cemetery for the burials. You know, they don't usually do that, right? They, they usually dig the hole and then they go someplace else in, so they're not seen until after the graveside service is done and everybody's left and gone. And then they go back and they fill in the hole and they tidy things up, etc. Well, these guys decided to go to the graveside service and not disappear because they've been asked to, 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 to dig a hole big enough to put a Cadillac car in. And they wanted to know who needed a hole that size. So when the funeral procession arrived, they dashed up to the, to the director's car and said, why do we have to dig such a big hole? And he said, well, it was self-explanatory. You were asked to dig a hole big enough to put a Cadillac in, right? They said, yes. He said, well, the idea is the man who died was a very rich millionaire and required as one of his last requests that when he died, he'd be buried in his Cadillac car. So there was a beautiful champagne edition Cadillac car sitting off to the side, fully loaded. They opened up the, the hearse. They pulled the casket out. They pulled the corpse out of the casket. He was dressed in a, uh, you know, a... a, a, a a tuxedo, he had a flower on his lapel, he had gold rings on his fingers and they bent him in his shape behind the steering wheel and rigor mortis his hands to the wheel and closed the door of the car and they put the electronic uh, uh, crane magnetic then uh, attached to the top of the car and lifted it up off the ground and they were getting ready to lower it down in when one of the grave diggers looked at the other one and said, man, that's really living. You ever see the track someplace? I see them once in a while on a church bulletin board or a track rack that says you'll never see a, a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Right? You, you can't take it with you out of this. I did, my wife and I did see something very strange. We were in, in uh, no, uh, Prince Edward Island, Canada once and going by the ocean there and we saw a hearse with a boat attached to the back. I don't know what that was about. But uh, in any case... Crossing the River Jordan? I have no, no idea. But in any case, uh, don't, don't let yourself be preoccupied ground, all caught up with the things of the world. They can never satisfy your soul. Look at the last type of ground. That's the kind of Jesus wants all of our hearts to be. It says in verse 8, Another fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, and some 60, and some 100. And then it says, and this doesn't have to be delivered, uh, de developed very much, verse 20, These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit some 30, fold some 60 and some 100. So what kind of ground is this? We can call it, 
and we can call it productive ground. We can call it fruitful ground because it's been prepared. So when the seed is put there, it gets right down into the, into the ground and it's able to germinate and it's able to take the water and it's able to bring forth fruit. And notice there's even differences in how much preparation's been done to the amount of fruit that, that, that comes out of the ground there because of the seed. Some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. God would have each one of us to have 100-fold hearts. That when the word is being preached, when it's being taught, you've prepared your heart to the place where when it gets in there, it gets down into your heart. You get it into your heart, into your head, down into your heart so it comes out in your life. God wants us to be productive ground, fertile, fruitful ground. That's what the Bible says in Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. Uh, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted, that's transplanted by the rivers of water, the irrigation ditch, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. What kind of a tree is that? Well, you know, I, I've seen trees that... that uh, uh, more delicious, delicious fruit, but they didn't stay green all year round. And I've seen other trees that stay green all year round, but I don't know anybody who enjoys putting pine cones on their breakfast cereal. But here's a, a tree that, that stays green all year round and bears delicious fruit. It's a picture of abundant life. And that's what every one of us will have under the Word of God when we are having our hearts as prepared ground to receive the truth of the Word of God. I always tell people, when you're coming to revival meeting, when you're coming to church service, when your pastor's preaching, your Sunday school teacher's teaching, or you're even just sitting down to read your Bible, you ought to uh, pray two things. Number one, say, Lord, first of all, would you prepare my pastor's heart with a message that I need to hear today? Prepare my pastor's heart or my Sunday school teacher's heart with what I need to hear today. And then secondly, pray, Lord, would you prepare my heart to receive that message that you gave the pastor or the Sunday school teacher or that you ha- have for me in your word today as I sit down to read it. And I believe you'll never go away from the word of God. You'll never go away from a church service without a blessing from God if you'll prepare your heart to be p- prepared ground, productive ground, fruitful ground for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what kind of ground will your heart be this week? And what kind of ground will your heart be from now on till you see the Lord? I trust it'll be the hundredfold fruit producing ground. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us from it. And we pray, Lord, you help us to take heed and hearken to that which you've told us and apply it in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the guaranteed fruit that it will bring in each heart today. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.